first discuss, uh, paper we will discuss, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Hutchinson, again, who is uh, renowned in this particular field, the future of human rights in North Korea. George, if I can ask you to start. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, General Talali, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. When, when we think of North Korean human rights, we, we can't help but think of the lost opportunities, particularly over the last year, uh, where we could have built off momentum from the 2004 U.S. North Korean Human Rights Act, the 2014 Human Rights Council Commission of Inquiry Report, and South Korea's own uh, long-awaited 2016 North Korean Human Rights Act as well. But the first major missed opportunity happened when President Trump and President Moon first took office in early 2017. They actually, you know, they could have combined powerfully on the issue of human or North Korean human rights because background-wise, you've got President Trump's spontaneous communication style, his pressure tactics, President Moon's background as a civil rights attorney fighting against repressive government, fighting for the people's rights. Uh, but the call at the time was made to avoid poisoning the atmosphere. So ironically, it was President Trump who carried the human rights torch forward quite passionately as a component of the U.S.'s pressure campaign at the time. So we all remember his 2018 State of the Union speech, the 2017 speech in front of the South Korean National Assembly, very passionate. Uh, but then we watched in frustration as North Korean human rights vanished from even the U.S. agenda as denuclearization negotiations with Kim Jong-un began. Now, arguably, some would say rightly that North Korean human rights has been sacrificed at the altar of engagement with Kim Jong-un. But rather than channeling this disappointment into harsh criticism of the Moon administration's agenda or pointing out Donald Trump's uh, rhetorical vacillations or, frankly, pointing to both presidents' uh, complicated affections for Kim Jong-un, I'd like to argue instead that the future of North Korean human rights begin again now, and we need to lift the finger of diplomacy off the button, off the pause button, and promptly reinvigorate the issue of North Korean human rights, especially after what we saw in Hanoi. Because results from the Hanoi summit really revealed just how weak Kim Jong-un's negotiating position is. Kim's very unimaginative repackaging of Yongbyon served to confirm on the one hand, yet again, that North Korea is just simply not serious at all about denuclearizing, fully denuclearizing. On the other hand, Kim's bargaining target, which was the rollback of the five UN Security Council sanctions, was a straight up admission that the maximum pressure campaign was working, working effectively and foiling Kim's promises to build up North Korea's socialist economy. And that promise, if you'll recall, occurred last year, just before the Moon-Kim first inter-Korean summit and right before the Trump-Kim summit in Singapore. Kim Jong-un declared his nuclear forces were complete, miniaturization, was, miniaturization of nuclear weapons was done, the, applying the miniaturized nuclear weapons to the ballistic missiles was completed, and targeting the ballistic missiles long range into areas as far off as the U.S. mainland was complete. All of those tasks were squared away. So the time for completing nuclear weapons was done, and now he was announcing that he would go full tilt into building a powerful socialist economy. But when the Trump team walked away from the watered-down Young Bion uh, offer, Kim was left, and quite, quite embarrassingly, empty-handed. Because if, if you look at Kim's negotiating position, on the one hand, you've got North Korea inflexible on the issue of fully denuclearizing. And on the other hand, you've got the United States dug in on full denuclearization. This creates a very uncomfortable ever tightening space for Kim Jong-un to kind of wander around in and, and try and come up with a negotiating plan. So what the Hanoi summit really did was leave Kim Jong-un standing at a oft-used term crossroads between the economy 
and his nuclear program. And this is just for the IR folks. This is a classic guns or butter dilemma that he'll need to sort out and will affect the future of his regime, certainly, but it could also affect the fate of North Korea. Because without sanctions relief, and there's a distinction here between sanctions relief and the marketization efforts that we see, but without sanctions relief, Kim's socialist economic, economic prospects look dim. Unlike the rusty malfunctioning socialist part of the economy, the central socialist part of the economy, where North Korea has shown impressive growth uh, at the grassroots level, and this goes back to the 1990s, it has been the, the markets, the marketization phenomena that we've been seeing. But marketization for Kim Jong-un is a free-flowing, capitalistic sort of quaggy space that he certainly doesn't have full control over, nor, nor does the party. They tolerate it only out of necessity. So control is really what Kim Jong-un needs to exert, top-down, to payroll his operations and prioritize the large-scale capitalist or the socialist-type projects that, uh, that he's interested, interested in. So this can only happen with sanctions relief that restores central streams of funding into his economy that in turn can become centrally allocated based on regime priorities. Now, again, unlike the socialist portion of the economy, marketization has shown impressive growth since the 1990s and even, even since the UN sanctions regime was put in place in 2006. Today, there are between 400 and 500 markets, physical markets existing throughout the country, each containing up to 2,000 stalls where vendors operate and sell their goods. So in terms of spatial statistics, the markets are considered to be significantly clustered. If you near neighbor analysis would show that markets are significantly clustered throughout the country. Spatial dispersion characteristics would show that there's a strong vectoring effect of the markets along the rail system and along the border with China which would indicate a fairly sophisticated supply chain. Um, so in, and in terms of population per market, the highest concentration of markets is actually located in the Northeast, the Yangang and North Hamgyang provinces. And, th and these are the areas that actually suffered the worst uh, during the famine in the 1990s. So not only are the markets increasing, but the activities supporting market supply chains are growing more sophisticated. Cell phones are being increasingly used to communicate with uh, agents and transportation services, buyers and sellers and so forth. And that's creating distinct wholesale and retail supply chains. Now, the regime is growing dependent on the markets because it counts on rents generated by the markets and regime officials are growing more dependent because they count on the bribes that they get from the vendors who operate their stalls. So it's this growing dependency on marketization that makes it difficult for the Kim regime to get out in front of. Again, to maintain control, Kim needs sanctions relief. So Kim's counter strategy now to the US dug in position to keep the lid on sanctions until North Korea commits to full denuclearization is to soften the US stance by creating first an ultimatum, which he's already done by giving the United States a deadline by the end of the year for sanctions relief. And then second, to resort to small scale provocations designed to stay under the threshold of nuclear and long range ballistic missile testing. Of course, we've seen that with the recent short range missile tests. But more important, he'll ramp up full scale information campaign operations to pressure Seoul and create tension between the United States and South Korea while he appeals to a distracted international audience in order to gain sympathy and food aid. Of course, we see this happening now as well. So now here's a transition point. Even if the United States, best case scenario for Kim Jong-un, even if the United States were to soften its stance and even if North Korea were to show acceptable progress with denuclearization, <laughs> sanctions relief is still prohibited under U.S. law, under sections 401, 402 of the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act, unless North Korea demonstrates certifiable progress in sanctionable areas. This is very important. So not just denuclearization, this, this includes human rights as well. 
So North Korea's, North Korea's uh, latest appeal for food aid winds up being a brilliant reminder of the importance of human rights, because legally, should, be food, should food be sent to North Korea, Pyongyang, as a prerequisite to sanctions relief, would have to demonstrate responsive and equitable distribution and allow for the transparent monitoring of aid in line with international standards. Now, under the law's human rights provisions, North Korea is not even eligible for temporary <clears throat> sanctions relief until it, A, conforms with international standards for humanitarian aid distribution and monitoring, and B, improves living conditions in the political prison camp. So, legally, human rights is a requisite component to any discussion of sanctions relief. U.S. law, if you read it, doesn't necessarily prioritize denuclearization over North Korean human rights. And thanks to North Korea's food aid request, there's now a spontaneous opening through which to finesse human rights back into dialogue. So Earth to UN. Uh, anybody out there work for the UN? So if, if you do mobilize to coordinate aid into North Korea this time, you're duty bound by your own policies to ensure that it's done with human rights in mind. And what I'm referring to is the human rights upfront approach which came into effect in early 2013. And that's a policy that ensures that the entire UN enterprise, the entire UN system operates with human rights in mind in order for aid to reach all vulnerable groups in need. So Roberta Cohen, HRNK's co-chair emeritus, has written eloquently on how the human rights upfront approach should be used as a basis for aid in North Korea, whereby aid agencies on the ground would be granted increased access to all vulnerable groups throughout the country, including prisoner populations. Now, the perfect model to use to implement this human rights upfront approach, arguably, in my view, is Nick Everstadt's intrusive aid model. Aid under Nick's uh, intrusive aid model would be administered non-negotiably by organizations providing the aid, staffed by Korean-speaking outsiders, and would include access to the prison camps. So, Nick's aid model would be the essential counter to the endemic structural problems that we've seen uh, since the 1990s, at least, with regard to North Korea's centralized distribution methods, and it would ensure equitable treatment, answering Roberta Cohen's uh, human rights up front uh, approach uh, for those marginalized by Pyongyang's Sungbun political caste system. Now, this especially applies to the vulnerable groups that are found in the Northeast. So you're probably asking, so would, would North Korea ever realistically even agree to any of this? Well, actually, the 2008 food aid agreement be between Pyongyang and Washington could serve as a draft model from which to refine a new, a new agreement that would bring it into the future. The 2008 agreement stipulated that food would only be shipped to the Northeast provinces and that monitoring would be improved in order to get the food to the intended recipients. Now, in addition to Roberta's basis and, and Nick's uh, intrusive aid model, I'd also recommend incorporating use of the markets, especially those in the northeastern provinces, because, and this would be as opposed to, to using the central government as a, as a central node to get food aid in. The markets would be great to use as distribution nodes to take full advantage of logistical and storage infrastructure and the countrywide supply chain linkages using rail and using vehicles, using the pre-built transportation services, using everything that you would need if you had to distribute goods. Using the markets as distribution points would make the aid more equitably accessible by vulnerable groups. It would help aid agencies more effectively monitor whether food aid is being diverted. A lot of the food aid winds up getting diverted into the market, so what better place for food aid to be distributed if you're trying to monitor it? It would also complement and reinforce the current marketization effects, the bottom-up marketization effects that we see. So my ultimate recommendation for the administration and for the international community, by all means, continue to hold firm on the sanctions until all conditions, uh, and this includes human rights, are met. For the U.S. to remain cognizant of its legal prohibitions on North Korean sanctions relief, but to be open to food aid, and, and potentially lots of it if necessary, but work to ensure the equitable, transparent distribution of aid 
to address human rights, but not only for the obvious humane reasons, but also to stay within the bounds of U.S. law. I think that this approach would be the optimal response to the uncomfortable and ever-tightening <clears throat> guns or butter decision space that Kim Jong-un is currently wandering around in empty-handed. Thank you. Uh, thanks for setting that up. That was excellent. And, and I think as we go through each of our panels, you'll see how these all dovetail uh, to give us a complete picture of uh, human rights and aid and where that fits. I think the other piece is, as you looked at some of the questions that were being asked of Mr. Began uh, during the lunch hour, uh, the question was asked, which is our next topic that uh, uh, Greg Scarletto is going to uh, address, and that's the tying human rights to the U.S. North Korea rock negotiations. Uh, we, we heard from George where the U.S. policy has been and, and how that should move forward, but I think we're going to get a more holistic picture now from Greg as we move uh, into this topic. Greg. Thank you, General Delilly. You set the stakes very high, sir. George Hutchinson, I had one good line. Human rights have often been sacrificed on the altar of the North Korean political and military and security conundrum, and you took it away from me. I, I didn't ask I'm you. joking. <laughs> I'm joking. On a very serious note, today is uh, June the 4th, 2019. Today we commemorate 30 years since the Tiananmen Square massacre. <clears throat> I'm a naturalized American, born and raised on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain in communist Romania. I was a freshman at Bucharest University when the Ceausescu regime f fell, and I witnessed it up close and personal. And us Eastern Europeans who lived under communism continue to this day to be grateful to multiple U.S. administrations that did not give up on the human rights of Eastern Europeans and I'll say it in particular, the Reagan administration. Thank you very much. For over a year now, we have witnessed movement on Korean Peninsula issues. I think that there isn't one amongst us who wouldn't agree that we all want peace, reconciliation, security, freedom, democracy, development, prosperity, and unification for all Korean people in the South and in the North. And we do know that the ultimate measure of inner Korean unification, inner Korean reconciliation will be the impact it has on Korean people living in the South and in the North. That impact cannot be positive if we ignore the human rights of those 25 million Koreans living on the northern half of the Korean Peninsula. For three decades, multiple administrations, and here I'm bringing up the, the altar line, multiple U.S. administrations have sacrificed human rights on the altar of very serious political security, military concerns, nukes and missiles. We're talking millions of lives. How did that work out? Not too well. Perhaps it's time to factor in human rights concerns in a comprehensive approach to the DPRK, to the Kim regime. Um, I would argue that rather than being an impediment, coordination amongst allies centered on human rights may be conducive to cooperation and let's say it amongst us allies, the Republic of Korea, the United States and Japan, perhaps conducive to better trilateral coordination. After all, we and this has been mentioned several times today, in uh, February 2013, the UN Human Rights Council passed a resolution establishing a UN Commission of Inquiry that published its report in February 2014. It submitted the report to the Council. We know what the report is about. It finds that what's happening in North Korea is crimes against humanity being perpetrated pursuant to policies established at the highest level of the state. There is an informal coalition of UN member states that was behind the resolution, the establishment of the UN COI, and behind multiple UN Human Rights Council resolutions every spring and UN General Assembly resolutions in third committee every fall. Well, 
Some members of the coalition were also behind the inclusion of North Korean human rights in the agenda of the UN Security Council in December 2016, 2017, and, um, and um, prior to that, inclusion of human rights in, well, first it was an ARIAS formula meeting, ARIA formula meeting in 2014, followed by inclusion in 2015, 16, 17, not this past December. It just didn't happen. It needed nine out of 15 votes of permanent and non-permanent members, and we could not make that happen. But the point that I'm trying to make is that this informal coalition of state UN member states supportive of efforts to address North Korean human rights has included the United States, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the European Union, and of course others, Australia, New Zealand, other like-minded states. It will be very difficult for this coalition to operate without even one of its key members. For the past few months, my colleague Rosa Park and my other colleagues know that we have been working uh, quite intensely on the, the abductee issue with our friends in, in Japan. We've had fairly sizable events here in Washington, D.C., and also a side event at the U.N., uh, an event uh, that featured um, Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, who is rumored to be moving, who knows, perhaps to higher places at some stage in, in the future, an event co-hosted by the permanent missions of the United States, Japan, the European Union, and Australia. Of course, one of the key members of the coalition was absent, and that is truly a pity. And this will eventually have a bearing on the effectiveness of efforts at the UN. Of course, none of us will speak against diplomacy. I'm a student of diplomacy myself. Diplomacy is great. Diplomacy is the D in the dime. The Trump administration has basically uh, projected um, or tried to project all elements of national power in the dime, including diplomacy, through a tool that had never been tested before, summit diplomacy. It was very encouraging, and George uh, mentioned uh, President Trump hosting disabled uh, activist, uh, North Korean escapee, Chi Song Ho at the State of the Union address, his meeting with eight escapees in the Oval Office, the Vice President's meeting with uh, North Korean escapees on the sidelines of the Pyeongchang Olympics. But then, as we have proceeded with these multiple rounds of inner Korean USDPRK um, diplomacy, uh, human rights has, of course, again, been pushed into the background, somehow lost in translation. Um, of course, please forgive me for bringing up the, the cliché, uh, trust but verify. Um, with North Korea, of course, there is the problem is that before going to verification, before going to CVID or FFVD, there is no trust. This is a regime that joined the MPT, pulled out of the MPT, and developed nuclear weapons. This is a regime that has ratified the two covenants, is bound by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a UN member state, and yet it, it violates each and every conceivable human right. So there is absolutely zero, zero credibility. Uh, this is a regime that has breached just about each <clears throat> and every international obligation it has ever assumed. So perhaps North Korea's willingness to agree to the resolution of key human rights issues arising from its international obligations may provide a litmus test of whether it is truly ready and willing to proceed with steps toward final, fully verified denuclearization. Um, actual steps, concrete steps such as granting humanitarian access to its vast system of unlawful imprisonment and the eventual closure of this system and the relocation of prisoners, allowing uh, unrestricted reunions of separated families, an issue that has been in the news very recently, all of these could constitute critical components of that litmus test. As tough as that might be, and we all know it. 
course, we follow very closely developments in, in South Korea, and we, we understand that under previous administrations, and I will say it under the two previous conservative administrations, it's not meant to be a partisan statement, it's just a statement, the human rights movement did receive a major boost in support, and we do see that now the focus of the South Korean government has shifted away from human rights accountability toward humanitarian assistance. Now, for reasons that George Hutchinson has already mentioned, there can be no responsible humanitarian assistance without transparency, without monitoring, without ensuring that it reaches the most vulnerable, and you, George, have quoted Roberta and Nick, uh, how do you find out who the most vulnerable are? How do you find out who needs what? Well, through site visits. So access uh, is extraordinarily important. Unfortunately, just giving away stuff for the sake of appeasing the North Korean regime is not going to do any good to the people of North Korea, in particular to the most vulnerable people in North Korea. So we're truly facing a, a set of challenges, and of course, if you talk to our friends within the North Korean escapee community, they will tell you that the only lifeline they have left is the U.S. government, so let's not just bash the U.S. government because a lot of good things are being done. And what, one of them is increased support for North Korean human rights groups. Currently, the South Korean government, which is more focused on inner Korean reconciliation, appeasement, and so on and so forth, has cut the funding of North Korean human rights organizations, which means zero, no support. They were here just recently with our friend Suzanne Scholtenik. Uh, they used to have support from the South Korean government to travel to D.C. for North Korea Freedom Week. They had to raise their own funds in a very, very, very long time. However, the U.S. government has been providing that lifeline that ensures that at least some of these organizations continue their research, continue their investigation, continue to report and speak up about the abysmal human rights situation in North Korea. Now, of course, um, what do we know about what's happening in North Korea today, despite public statements? Um, we do know that the situation continues to be abysmal. We follow very closely through witness testimony, and uh, we have recently, just very recently, over the past few weeks, interviewed a group of, well, 50 North Korean escapees, most of them former prisoners at different types of facilities, many of them recent arrivals, we have come to the realization that uh, there are increased security measures at North Korea's political prison camps. We've identified double, sometimes triple-walled security fences seen via satellite imagery, which would make, of course, escape less probable. We have identified small, secured internal compounds inside larger detention facilities which seem to indicate that these are holding facilities for high-value prisoners. Obviously, this is connected to the purges we have been hearing about since 2009, when North Korea began preparing for the second hereditary transmission of power. <clears throat> and uh, we do see disproportionate repression of women. Women, married women in particular, are the ones who are most active at North Korea's markets. They're the ones who get arrested, imprisoned, for alleged wrongdoing. Uh, women are the ones who escape into China without government approval in search of perhaps freedom, perhaps better economic opportunities. The reasons don't matter. They're arrested and forcibly repatriated to a place, North Korea, where they face a credible fear of persecution sending them back, forcibly repatriating them, is a clear violation of the 1951 UN Convention concerning the status of refugees and its 1967 additional protocol. Uh, so, um, again, looking at these important issues, some key human rights issues 
could be considered for inclusion in U.S. North Korea diplomatic engagement. We heard about the pillars early today. There are no human rights in the pillars. Our job as human rights organizations is to spray paint the pillars with human rights issues. That's what we're doing here today on this panel. There are lots and lots of issues that the student of North Korea would include. For example, the Songbun system of social discrimination. Our own Robert Collins has written a book for HRNK about this topic. The Songbun system is based on perceived loyalty to the regime. Any type of opportunity depends on the Songbun system. I know it sounds like an insane proposition right now, but any promise of change or abolishment of the Songbun system would be an immeasurable step toward improving the lives of millions of North Koreans. Not to mention political prisoners and, and gulags. Yes, there are lots and lots of difficult issues when it comes to North Korea, but there are people being tortured and dying in North Korea's gulag today, as we speak from this panel. This is an extraordinarily urgent issue. This is a human rights crisis. And we want this regime <clears throat> to provide locations, confirm locations of his political prisons, accounts of his political prisoners. We want access granted to international organizations and civil society organizations to these facilities, we want to see the subsequent release of political prisoners and their families as a proof of good faith and intent to change on the part of the regime. We are dealing with a regime that focuses on areas that are critical to its own survival. Nukes, missiles, keeping the elites happy. They need money. How do they procure the money? By oppressing and exploiting their own people at home and abroad. Um, a 2018 Global Serv Slavery Index uh, found that North Korea has an estimated 2.6 million people living in modern-day slavery, making North Korea the country with the highest prevalence of modern-day slavery in the world today. I'm not even mentioning the 100,000 North Korean workers officially dispatched overseas to about 30 countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, the Middle East, with up to 90% of their salaries being confiscated by the regime. Um, the issues are there. Again, separated families is another issue that has been in the news. We've heard about Korean-American family members who have a keen interest in being reunited with um, their, their long-lost family members in the North. Uh, this is also an issue that can be added to the agenda. Um, we do know that we should not despair. We have seen multiple official statements expressing keen interest in the North Korean human rights situation. It's George and I mentioned statements by President Trump, but also statements by previous uh, US government officials under multiple administrations, including U.S. ambassadors to the United Na Nations, U.S. national security advisors, special representatives for North Korea policy. Speaking of which, it would be really, really, really nice to have a special envoy for North Korean human rights. Ambassador King was here today. Uh, we haven't had one since, uh, since January 2017. And um, the Honorable Steve Began can cover a lot of issues, but certainly I, I don't think that the two portfolios can combine. So we have seen uh, statements by U.S. government officials that indicate that you know, we, we have been aware, we understand the issue. Again, the issue has been outplayed and outcompeted by more, what's perceived as more serious concerns. But if I were to take away a bumper sticker from today's conference, and I'm very sorry that Bruce Bechtel is no longer here because I could have earned some serious school points, is a statement that Bruce made this morning. He said, the nuclear issue is just a symptom, is just a symptom of the very nature of the regime in North Korea. And in order to resolve all of these pressing political security military issues, one has to go to the core of the problem, which is the nature of the regime, which will never be resolved without addressing human rights. And of course, we've seen historical precedents. Um, we, well, 
I'm not saying that I advocate for one particular approach or for another, but of course all of us remember the Helsinki process and basket three. Uh, the main purpose of the Helsinki Accords being to reduce tensions between the Western world and the Soviet bloc by ensuring mutual acceptance of the new world order following the end of World War II. It was a multilateral approach that included both collective security and human rights. Now, of course, knowing the North Koreans, uh, it would be certainly, um, there would be a downside to a Helsinki process type approach. This might play, honestly, into the hands of the Kim Jong-un regime, allowing the regime to execute its fundamental strategic objectives, survival and recognition as a nuclear state, by insisting on the denuclearization of the entire Korean Peninsula, which is a phrase that we seem to adopt every now and then, uh, as well, uh, this is again a North Korean formulation, the Kim regime indicates that rather than final, fully verified denuclearization, its interest is recognition as a nuclear power through SALT, strategic arms limitation talks, or start type talks, strategic arms reduction talks, and of course, Helsinki type interaction might enable the regime to do just that and gain recognition. But the reason why I raise the Helsinki precedent is just to say that there is historical precedent. Moreover, we'll remember that the Reagan-Schultz approach, and this is a bilateral approach to the, the issue of the Soviet Jewry, to the issue of, of Soviet refuseniks. So basically, um, President Reagan and uh, Secretary of State George Shultz back in the day were leading advocates of the Soviet Jewry movement and uh, they, they pushed very hard for the, an increase in the quota for Soviet Jewish immigrants um, and basically um, President Reagan and Secretary Shultz insisted on this and reaffirmed the commitment of the United States to the immigrants freedom of choice. We're also dealing with a highly vulnerable group of people, that of North Koreans attempting to escape the country facing conditions of extreme danger. Perhaps there might be an opportunity to, um, to forge an approach to this slowly, slow motion human rights crisis and refugee crisis building on that precedent. And of course, the president of the, the Jackson Vanik Amendment, which you, which you will remember. Um, then again, very important precedent. We are dealing with a regime that's committing crimes against humanity. That is a very serious charge. Killing, maiming, torturing, raping people in his political prison camps. Um, we dealt with apartheid in South Africa. It was not easy for the United States. Remember, there was a very important security relationship with South Africa on the subcontinent and the continent, and then there was this abysmal, abysmal human rights violation. You know, the South Africans, and I think all of us have mentioned this before, their sports teams were banned from uh, international competition, no more rugby, that really hurt. You know, with the North Koreans, uh, the approach seems to be so different. It's a regime that's committing crimes against humanity, and yet we beg them, can you please come to the Pyeongchang Olympics? Oh my God, the cheerleaders are coming. Please, can the cheerleaders come? Terrific, fantastic, please, let's play a game of soccer, because the rights of, of our brothers and sisters in North Korea will improve if we just play that game of soccer. Oh, by the way, the stands are, are empty. They don't allow anyone to, to watch the game. So. You do feel a little bit of frustration. I think that's okay, because we are dealing with a relatively difficult yes, sir, set of circumstances. On the other hand, my colleagues, Rosa Park, the others, and I regard this as an opportunity, uh, because frankly, it's civil society organizations such as ourselves that have been left on the front line. And I'm very grateful to Nick Eberstadt, to Dave Maxwell, to Bob King, and the other board members who have represented HR and case board today. It's a very tough mission, but unless we civil society organizations speak up and keep spray painting those pillars with human rights, uh, I don't think we stand a chance. So thank you for being here today. I thought I, I'd be speaking to just uh, three people left in the room. Well, you have stayed and this is great. Thank you for listening. I look forward to the Q&A. Greg, Greg, thanks for your passion.
this is a topic that deserves passion and we not only have to keep spraying the pillars if you will it has to be an indelible paint that doesn't get washed off from administration to administration the order has already been placed sir great our next topic uh, again when we think about uh, rock us alliance and the role of the rock us alliance and what it will play in human rights i think uh, dr kim will uh, give us a, a lesson to learn here we go thanks dr kim thank you sir <laughs> thank you everybody well I think I should say thank you first of all, you know, excellent two papers and uh, Dr. Scala Toe's uh, presentation, uh, so impressive, so touching. I was impressed, you know, thank you again. <laughs> uh, I will be using my 20 minutes uh, to talk about uh, alliance collaboration, uh, including a collaboration over uh, human rights. So uh, in order to save time, I will uh, use my PowerPoint material. Uh, and then the, I will appreciate if you read my uh, paper for further details. OK, in this uh, first slide, I just want to clarify so-called specter of denuclearization of a Joseon Peninsula. Uh, this is really, really deceptive language, but uh, I think it's taking time for Americans to understand the deceptive nature of, of this terminology, you know. Uh, Kim Il-sung uh, used this term uh, to demand withdrawal of uh, tactical nuclear weapons from South Korea. And after withdrawal of, of, of tactical nuclear uh, weapons, uh, North Korea still used the same term uh, in order to contend that all U.S. threat to the DPRK should first, should be first removed. So the, uh, the denuclearization of Joseon Peninsula doesn't have anything at all with uh, the voluntary gi giving up of nuclear weapons. You know? So it is taking time for Americans to understand this. You know? This language has been greatly misused by Seoul government for the last two years. You know? Uh, Seoul government say, look, uh, now North Korea is committed to denuclearization. So uh, government is telling this to the international community, to Washington and to South Korean public. And still many people don't understand the, the trap and the, the deceptive nature behind this expression. You know? So that's why I'm clarify, clarifying uh, the meaning, real meaning of this language as the most immediate and the most important backdrops against which we can discuss how to collaborate. You know? So this is the purpose of uh, the uh, first slide. You know? Okay, then uh, in what area, what kind of collaboration is, is needed? Uh, okay, basically we need the collaboration, alliance collaboration in the areas of uh, sanctioning DPRK and human rights, of course, and, and security. Uh, South Korea, I think it, this is the, the responsibility, the bottom line responsibility of South Korea to participate in uh, sanctioning North Korea and the maximum pressure of a US government. This is this is bottom line responsibility as an ally. We need this in order to let North Korea know that adherence to nuclear weapons will give them intolerable damages. You know. So this is why we should do this. You know. uh, and in security area, I think we should not negotiate out our alliance asset uh, just the, to back dialogue uh, to Pyongyang and North Korean regime. And we should not uh, reduce our military drill, joint military drill, we should not do that. To the contrary, we should strengthen, we should increase them in proportion to the North Korean defiance or in proportion to the deadlocked the period of nuclear talks. So this is the way we should do uh, in, in areas of security collaboration. So we should not make concession in this, in this area. You know. Uh, if necessary, we should discuss 
uh, the possibility of uh, redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons again. Why not? If North Korea further delays, and if North Korea further shows defiance, or in some cases, we may have to discuss possibility of supporting nuclearization of Asian allies like Japan and South Korea. By doing this, we can press North Korea. We can press uh, Beijing to change their policy line and uh, to understand that if North Korean nuclear issues, if let go on indefinitely, can change the whole strategic uh, landscape in this area. So of course, personally, I don't think we, South Korea, uh, will go nuclear, so that will not happen. But why not, why not talk about using that as a diplomatic card, pressing North Korea and, and, and Beijing? Why not do that? You know? so South Korea will not go nuclear without uh, agreement within the framework of alliance. You know? So anyway, these are the basic areas we should collaborate. And in human right, this is a really tricky area. Actually, this is an unexplored area. You know? Uh, I think everybody knows what's happening in North Korea, and, and uh, Dr. Scalato already described very, very, very well. You know, abysmal human rights situation. We all remember that in uh, the 2014 COI report concluded a comprehensive, systematic, gross violation of human rights is going on in North Korea. And that report also recommended referring, uh, referring to the supreme leader in North Korea to international criminal court. You know. So actually, everything was described by UN organizations and specialists like him. You know. okay, so I won't spend much time on, on this, uh, but I want to spend a few minutes to introduce to you an uh, a untold story, human rights story. According to a research project conducted the last year, uh, North Korean defectors who had lived in the areas adjacent to nuclear test site are now showing a serious gene disruption. Uh, their estimated, uh, estimated uh, radio, uh, radiation exposure level is little, very, very serious. Uh, actually, when I asked the researcher to tell me uh, the result, the outcome of, of, of the research, uh, she was very, very careful, very, very careful. Uh, she's a defector, uh, North Korean defector, uh, because South Korean government is very sensitive in the upsetting uh, North Korea. So uh, this is what, what, what's happening, actually. So uh, I, I'd like to argue that uh, very immediate attention should be paid to this issue. Innocent people in North Korea living just the area adjacent to the, the, the nuclear test site are dying without knowing what's happening to them. You know, They are defenselessly exposed to radioactive contamination. So, so this is a really urgent issue, I would argue, like that. Uh, in this slide, I also want to emphasize that uh, approaching North Korea through a human rights issue, human rights problem, uh, is really, really important. It can be, a, 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 it can be like a, a silver bullet or a panacea that can uh, settle uh, all North Korea problems, including nuclear ones. Well, when the uh, Professor Bechtol said uh, nuclear matters are just a, a one symptom of a whole North Korea problems, totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, approaching human rights, human rights approach is the conclusion as well as the beginning of, of solving North Korea's nuclear problems. You know, uh, Imagine if North Korea becomes a country respecting human rights, then nuclear matters will be automatically Settled. Nuclear weapons are the culprit that isolate the North Korean people. You know, uh, so if North Korea becomes a country respecting human rights, it can be automatically democratized, 
And then the, the legitimacy of the hereditary uh, uh, dictatorial government will no, no longer stand. You know. uh, the same context, uh, human right approach is uh, eventual goal as well as a means of unification. You know. So this is a really important, but still unexplored territory, you know. So <laughs> we should do something. So anyway, uh, I'll move on. And here uh, in this slide, I'd like to single out uh, some obstacles that blocks actually our human right approach toward North Korea. Uh, because of time limit, I will not uh, elaborate, but uh, I will single out the number one our alliance is not in good shape, frankly speaking. You know. well, uh, yesterday I said, you know, uh, another institute, you know, if uh, U.S. Di diplomat or South Korean diplomat or uh, high-ranking uh, military officer say, oh, okay, our alliance is okay, uh, uh, don't worry, and the suspension of uh, military drill doesn't hurt our alliance, if they say that, then uh, it would be okay with me because I can understand. They have reasons why they have to say it that way. But if they say that because they believe so, then uh, he or she should have some problems in the, in the cognitive function. You know. uh, <laughs> so uh, there are many factors, you know, many factors, North Korean factors and, and uh, the Trump factors and South Korean factors. Mm -hmm. uh, North Korea has uh, so far successfully conducted the so-called, uh, the, the calculated uh, madness game, you know, the, uh, or rationality of irrationality game, you know. So uh, increasing number of U.S. citizens are asking questions, so why should we brave uh, becoming uh, to become a, 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 a nuclear attack of North Korea to protect South Korea, you know. So this is an uh, alliance decoupling effect. You know. And then the Trump effect. Uh, we know that uh, President Trump uh, has some uh, commercialistic approach to uh, alliance policy, and he has a propensity prefer preferring immediate interest and, and gain rather than the traditional uh, values. Uh, so this is a so-called the Trump factor. But uh, the final judgment should be postponed because uh, we still don't know. Uh, 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 President Trump may be uh, dealing with North Korea in ways North Korea has never experienced uh, under a, a more grand grandiose, uh, uh, a more deeper uh, strategy to fundamentally change North Korea. So we don't know yet. We don't know yet. So anyway, uh, alliance has been shaken by this fact too. But uh, what is most damaging to our alliance is uh, our own government uh, policy, you know, revisionist policy. You know. uh, so we have to admit that frankly, uh, South Korea is now diplomatically isolated. And also, uh, South Korea's military capabilities are shrinking uh, because of many uh, self-inflict measures. You know, uh, one of them is, of course, uh, the inter-Korean military agreement signed last year. Well, probably some of you already know that the signing of that military agreement uh, triggered inception of so-called uh, Coal Guard. This is uh, a newly born uh, NGO. Uh, it's, all these members are retired generals and admirals. So the, the, the full name is uh, Korean retired, uh, Korean retired generals and admirals corps defending the nation. This is Korgat. So uh, it was born uh, this year, early this year, with the member of uh, 420, but now its membership is uh, uh, growing uh, over 900, 900. So this uh, NGO, uh, it's my own. I am one of them, the only civilian expert, you know, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, this organization uh, demanded the government to discard the agreement and called for the resignation of a minister of defense, you know. 
So anyway, this is the, the situation. Our alliance itself is not in good shape. So then the collaboration is uh, uh, in, uh, more, more, more problematic, you know. So we, we should uh, uh, recognize that. And another obstacle, well, there are so many beautiful theories how to uh, deal with the North Korea in terms of uh, human rights. And there are a very a nice uh, suggestions made by Dr. Hutchinson. I read his uh, uh, article. Uh, well, there's many good uh, ideas there, you know, intrusive uh, uh, aid or uh, the transparency of distribution or monitoring system. And there are many ideas, but the implementation is a separate question. Implementation is a separate question. North Korea uh, does not and will not accept the recommendations. If they, recommend, if they accommodate their recommendations that they think their regime may collapse. You know. So it's, it's a real difficult problem. And also, and also the referring those current leaders to the International Cr uh, Criminal Court or uh, applying the so-called R2P concept to North Korea, R2P, uh, responsibility to protect. But the, those actions are possible only when there is a decision uh, of UN Security Council, where Russia and, and, and uh, China are, are two permanent members with the veto power. So implementation of policy is uh, another thing. So that, that's our dilemmatic situation. So anyway, th those are the uh, obstacles. Here, my, I'd like to add one more possible obstacle. Uh, South Korea's position may be an obstacle, as uh, my colleague already mentioned, my government is not interested uh, in that. And also, uh, personally, I'm asking question, is my country, is my country really qualified to file human rights problems in North Korea? Uh, I would not elaborate what's happening in South Korea. But I, personally, I'm serious. Uh, are we really in uh, a morally justifiable position? to file complaint about absence of freedom of press or absence of some right or I don't know, I don't know. So this may be another obstacle. So in this slide, what I mean is uh, human right approach to North Korea is, is, is very, very important, but still implementation is another separate question. You know? so that's my point here. So the final slide. Am I time too much? Or? <laughs> okay, as a conclusion, I'd like to emphasize two things. Uh, first, let's not forget uh, the uh, all encompassing effect or enormous impact of human right approach to North Korea. Let's not forget human right approach, human right approach can be, can be a more powerful than the military intervention or economic sanctions. You know. uh, it can solve, it can solve all North Korea problems, including nuclear weapon problems. You know. So let's not forget that. And also in this context, I'd like to uh, argue that the people here should do something to deal with the, the immediate human rights questions. I mean, the people living in the areas of the nuclear test site. I, I personally hope my respected uh, colleague, Dr. Scala To, uh, does something you know, to this issue. If you want, I will introduce the researcher. You know. <laughs> okay, second uh, point. But still, we should not forget uh, the stark reality that is rendering our talking about the human rights uh, approach a mere luxury. You know. Let's not forget that. Uh, actually, really, all players are on the crossroad in my analysis. North Korea is on the, on the crossroad, you know. There is no easy uh, choice for North Korea. Counterattack, confronting whole world, or submission to US pressure, then their legitimacy internally will collapse, you know. So there is no easy choice for North Korea. For South Korean government, also on the crossroad. There are many questions already. 
uh, other uh, ideologically oriented policy goals attainable? Or somebody asked, uh, is this government politically sustainable? So we don't know yet. We don't know yet. But uh, on the crossroad, on the crossroad. Alliance is on the crossroad. We should do something in this area. And finally, uh, South Korean democracy is also on the crossroad. Will it uh, swim, swim out or sink? Uh, we are on the crossroad. Uh, so let's not forget this. This is a really critical moment for South Korea. Uh, as a conclusion, I would say this, you know, today South Korea, today Korean Peninsula are drifting into a dangerous direction uh, due to the combination of North Korea's uh, Galapagos syndrome. Have you heard of that, right? And South Korea's Stockholm syndrome and uh, boil the frog syndrome of South Korean people. North Korea still close door and uh, adhere to their own system and clings to their uh, nuclear weapons. And the South Korean government is still in love with the criminal that takes the whole nation hostage. You know. Still many South Korean people don't know they may be killed like a frog in a, a slowly warming water. So let's hope South Korean government look back upon the past two years and change its policy line, policy lines, and then realize that alliance, recovery of alliance, health and trust comes first. So let's hope that. If that's impossible, let's hope that the South Koreans get disillusioned from the boiled the frog uh, syndrome and try all together to put this nation right back on the right track. You know, I, I should stop here. Thank you for your listening. <laughs> Dr. Kim, thank you very much. Uh, needless to say, very stimulating comments, and uh, I think you'll get a lot of questions on uh, some of your uh, uh, theses. Uh, let, let me, let's go to discussions, and I'd like to give you about 10 minutes each, uh, talk about each of the papers or one specifically, and I'd like to start, start with Dr. Eberstadt. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there are there are a few places around Washington and a whole lot of places around Seoul where people would have absolutely hated each one of these papers. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to, back to that. Um, but you didn't draw a discussant who dislikes these papers. You drew a discussant who fundamentally not only appreciates but agrees with the theses of each of your arguments and who furthermore agrees with General Talelli that there is a very nice complementarity between the three papers. George Hutchinson's uh, analysis of the situation <laughs> in North Korea and the strategy for food aid uh, and in uh, Inter Alia, his fun and games with Stata uh, I never thought I would live long enough to see someone pull a chi-square out on a <laughs> conference here, but uh, the world's always more interesting than I can imagine. Um, <clears throat> Greg's a beautiful paper and beautifully eloquent paper about the realities in North Korea. And um, I mean, I don't know how you do this, Greg. I mean, this this is your third language. This is your fourth language. Uh, it's uh, it's really immensely moving and uh, I think compelling. And uh, Professor Kim's very, uh, uh, I think, convincing uh, <laughs> assessment of the gaps in the alliance with respect to what's missing with human rights uh, as an element and. <laughs> It was a very playful paper. I, I encourage you guys to read this. He, uh, he pulled the Galapagos syndrome out of the hat just at the end, but he's got a lot of other things about perfect storms and all sorts of things that are going on in this paper, which makes it, uh, makes it very fun to read. <clears throat> um, I'm 
I'm not going to ask you all to uh, write papers that you didn't write because I think you've all acquitted your assignments excellently. But I do have a question that I would like to pose to each of you. Um, there was a uh, bestseller a few years ago by a guy called Thomas Frank, and it was called uh, What's Wrong with Kansas? Uh, I'm not going to be asking you guys what's wrong with Kansas. Uh, give you a couple of just one or two anecdotes, which will kind of get at what I want to ask about. Back in 2004, I think it was, we can, you can Google this and find out if I'm right, uh, the Korea Human Rights Commission came up with a report, I think they released it on July 4th, to uh, indicate what the pressing human rights emergency was in the Korean Peninsula. <laughs> and the one that they identified was uh, forced haircuts in South Korean schools. Uh, the Korea Human Rights Commission and problems in the peninsula. I'm not making this up. Of course, I was under a sunshine government. Um, fast forward a few years, let's say to around 2012, and you're under a uh, so-called conservative government in the ROK. And there's a book uh, which was a bestseller everywhere else in the world called Escape from Camp 14. I'm sure many of you know it. It wasn't a bestseller in the South because it couldn't find a publisher in the South. Um, I think eventually a nonprofit institution, uh, I think, uh, published it uh, at a loss. I believe that although the book was written in uh, Korean, it appeared in Korean, I think, as maybe the 23rd or 24th language that the book came out in. I think you see what I'm trying to get at here. We're all familiar with this, uh, with this uh, awful uh, Landsat space map, which shows Northeast Asia with this dark area in uh, Northeast Asia between China and the ROK. But if we had some sort of an international human rights map, which did the same sort of thing for human rights activism about North Korea, the dark spot in the universe would be demarcated by the ROK. So the question is, what's wrong with South Korea? Um, it's not that we don't uh, understand the realities of the human rights nightmare in the DPRK. Um, I, I think it's been five years since the COI of the United <laughs> Nations uh, were beyond the point of uh, arguing whether information about this is really a CIA plot or uh, something that's coming from uh, my own beloved neoconservatives. Uh, it's, it's a matter which is afflicting the same nationality, the same compatriots. Um, so the question is, why? Why is there such an unseemly <coughs> silence about the suffering of tens of millions of people right across a demarcation line? Um, and not only, uh, not only by one side of a political party. There seems to be a remarkably limited appetite to discuss this. And maybe, uh, maybe Professor Kim, you've got a little bit to that in your, in your final comments. Um, I'd say that there's a lot of talk in, um, in the ROK today, in other areas, about asking whether things are up to world standards. It's clear that the human rights movement for North Korea is not up to world standards in the ROK. And this lack of interest or enthusiasm or even appetite to discuss this question, I'd submit, I can't prove this, but I would submit this is the single largest strategic weak point of the entire worldwide movement for promoting and championing uh, human rights in the DPRK. And so my question to each of you is why? Uh, I, uh, I'm not, uh, I have a, uh, a doctorate in political economy. I'm not a clinician. I, you know, I don't do, uh, I don't do 
uh, psychopathology or anything else. There may be historical reasons. Uh, there may be other reasons that we'd wish to discuss, but uh, understanding the reasons for this in a non-rhetorical, uh, calm and empirical way might be the first step towards overcoming uh, what I regard as a fundamental obstacle in this area. So, thank you all. Thank you for your great papers. Thank I'd be curious in your thoughts. Thank about you, Dr. Eberstadt. Dr. Rue. <coughs> thank you, Chairman Tinari. Here, I am the last discussant, but my comment and questions are not the last one. I read a much more significant one, I think. I have a three sport comment to Dr. Kim Teo and uh, three related questions. Uh, uh, first, as Dr. Kim Teo points out, the North Korean chairman Kim Jong Un's new proposal of phased denuclearization is nothing but another deceptive trick. He will never give up his nuclear weapons and missiles for his regime survival, winning negotiation against the United States and unification of, of all the Korean Peninsula by his weapons of massive destruction. In this aspect of human right of the, the Korean people, North Korean people, the nuclear tests have severely damaged the local residents' health and environment. Obviously, it is an, another violation of human rights of North Korean people. Uh, as Dr. and Mr. Hutchinson observed, uh, there is no reason for North Korea to dismantle uh, its nuclear weapons and missiles. North Korea's intention and reality is absolutely different from South America case. Therefore, the solution by international or bilateral negotiation with the North Korea uh, yeah, is the best and realistic way for North Korea to earn economic and security assistance with uh, its nuclear weapons and missiles. So such negotiation can, cannot be a realistic policy for the United States and the South Korea to dismantle the North Korean Korea's WMD. And the South Korean government seems led to help the North Korean policy. In this sense, why does the United States President Donald Trump hesitate a realistic military options, including preemptive strike and regime change by the military means? Uh, the preemptive strike is certainly the total once and for all, total solution to resolve North Korean problems, including WMD and human rights issue. Uh, in the last year in this conference, I strongly insist on preemptive strike, but till today, I have no idea what is the United States President's basic position. Uh, in this sense, what is the President Trump's new policies and strategies? to be able to end the denuclearization negotiation. So and second, and also Dr. Kim pointed out the solution of human rights issue of North Korea is an effective way to fundamentally resolve all of the North Korean problems, including WMD and uh, such as nuclear weapons, biochemical weapons, and missiles. Thus, the human rights issue is a significant tool and goal to resolve all of the North Korean problems. In the end, North Korean people will realize that their own nuclear weapons make them more dangerous because the United States will intensify and extend the economic and military sanction on the North Korean regime. In this circumstance, the North Korean people will be motivated to demand the regime to throw away their nuclear weapons and missiles. This seems to me Dr. Kim's essential point. I fully agree on this observation. Therefore, one of the most realistic way is to uh, intensively put pressure to North Korea, Korea to improve human rights of 
North Korean people with collaboration of the U.S. Iraq Military Alliance. So the U.S. with South Korea or U.S. alone must increase and extend the more intensive and heavy sanction on North Korea. Thus, the U.S. must simultaneously demand the nuclearization and improvement of human rights of North Korean people. And as Hutchinson points out, uh, and also Dr. Uh, Mr. Sklato uh, point out, uh, and uh, in this morning session, uh, Mr. Ferrier uh, also agreed, economic assistance and human rights issue cannot be separated. South Korea South Korea's inter-Korean economic project and the human rights issue must be simultaneously, uh, uh, synchronizedly uh, carried out. Uh, uh, now, so in this sense, it is essential to strengthen the United States and Evolve Korea Security Alliance for achieving both goals of denuclearization and improvement of human rights issue. Uh, North Korea's human rights issue has been vanished from, from the President Trump's summit agenda. Now, I do not know the President Trump's position on this issue. What is the President Trump's active and realistic position beyond the diplomatic verbal rhetorics? Third, and also Dr. Kim points out, the South Korean government is hesitating or shrinking, sucking, sucking its responsibility to strengthen the U.S. LAC alliance. Rather, it is trying to break away from the alliance. According to Dr. Kim's observation, the security and diplomacy between the United States and the Republic of Korea is becoming to trivialized, isolated, and marginalized. And then the U.S. LAC alliance is now also becoming rules or siege to exist. In this context, what is the President Trump's position in mind? Here, I am not asking to Dr. Kim, rather I am asking to the president, presenters and the discussant of American side. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting questions. What I'd like to do is uh, just go start with Dr. Kim and ha work towards the right and give you about two or three minutes to address uh, the discussants. I want to allow the, uh, those who have stayed to have a maximum opportunity to ask questions. So Dr. Kim, I'll start with you. Okay, uh, long, dark silence on what's happening uh, above the borderline. Well, uh, the human rights approach is not something South Koreans are very much used to uh, utilize so far. And uh, academic uh, accumulation is not much <laughs> comparing to the United States or European countries. And also our history of a democracy is, is shorter than other countries. Uh, and more decisively, on top of that, uh, uh, the Korean government uh, is not interested. In, uh, the, the, the case is the same even uh, in, in the previous government, you know, this is both conservative or progressive government. Uh, so uh, the, always the priority uh, was given to how to reconcile with North Korea or how to deter North Korean threat. Uh, so uh, absolutely there has been lack of discussion on human rights. So uh, it's a result of uh, a combination of a variety of reasons, I think. You know. uh, I think that's it. <laughs> no. I'd I like either Greg or George to address Dr. Everstadt's question, which, yes. uh, which is very, I, I think, a, a nuanced question that we'll never get to unless one of the two of you answer. Greg, why don't I go to you? Uh, yes, thank you for the great question, Nick. Uh, the first answer is textbooks. <laughs> South Korean textbooks do not tell the story of the North Korean gulag or human rights violations. Our children learn about the Holocaust from their textbooks. 
Why do South Korean textbooks not tell the story of North Korean human rights violations? Because they're dominated by very, very far left-leaning teachers' unions. There are cultural factors. This is a Confucian society. I have bright, bright, brilliant young men and women from South Korea who have volunteered for the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Some of them are in the room with us today. Um, however, human rights organizations and activists need good people and funding in order to survive and operate. South Korea is, of course, a Confucian society. It's not very big on charity, on giving. When people give, they give to educational causes, less so to human rights causes. Uh, there's another issue. Young South Koreans work very hard. They go to good schools. When they graduate, they and their parents want them to have great lives, work for one of the large corporations, for one of the chebols, for the government. They want them to have prestigious jobs. In the current world of South Korea, it's a very hard thing to say, but I'm one of them, so it's okay to say it. Uh, NGO jobs are not regarded as prestigious jobs. Human rights NGOs, even less so. North Korean human rights NGOs, even less so. So this adds some additional dimension to the problem we're facing. So how do you create opportunity by making funding available? Okay, so South Koreans, still a Confucian culture, are not very big on giving. Corporate entities have been punished under certain administrations when they gave two causes that were perceived as being conservative. Even when administrations change, a business person will never donate to the cause again because it's a headache. It's as simple as that. So the only source of funding is the government. Finally, after so many years, uh, both uh, ends of the political spectrum agreed, and they finally passed the North Korean Human Rights Act. The North Korean Human Rights Foundation was never funded. Funding for human rights projects was cut by 92%. So there is no funding available to create a pool of experts, young experts, to work on this particular issue. It has to go back, though, to textbooks. It has to go back to families understanding the gravity of the issue and talking to their children, not only going to the Sky Universities, being successful, making a lot of money and having great lives. I talked to my daughters about communism and Eastern Europe. Of course, I lived it. Uh, but the only way to ensure that issues are important to parents and families is to teach this issue in schools. Thank you. Jordan. <laughs> well, uh, two excellent questions. Let me address uh, Nick ever says add to, to Greg's comments on, on the cultural aspects of, uh, of why South Korea is not addressing this. Um, I, I would just add a political component. And, and if I had an opportunity, I'd channel Moon Jung-in, maybe, uh, maybe the ghost of No Mu Hyun, to, uh, to explain from a political standpoint why I, I see this uh, lack of recognition of human rights. And I just think it really cuts down the uh, Navy captain. We had a discussion yesterday, and uh, he made a, a great comment that there's really no middle uh, political component. You're either on the left or on the right when you find yourself talking politics in, uh, in Korea. And it cuts this way. So the conservatives speak very eloquently to human rights. The liberals, uh, and again, this is uh, Moon, Jae, uh, Moon, Jung, Moon Jung uh, in ma mainly. I think he does a lot of the talking for Moon Jae in in this space. They really believe that engagement will foster good feeling and, you know, <laughs> like, let's just make the environment nice here. And uh, we'll, you know, kibun, kibun We'll just kind of like work through this together, and then at some point, the North Koreans are going to get it. They're going to go. These guys are nice. They're reaching out to us. We're sitting down. We're sharing. We're, we're, you know, drinking alcohol in the appropriate manner. We're sharing coffee. Everything's going to work out. And and this we've seen this play out a few times under No Hyun. We saw it play out under Kim Dae Jung to a degree. And, and it, it really didn't play out all the way. It never got to the point where we'd ever see an endpoint like that. So I think just to add a, a political piece to that, and to uh, sort of your question, um, what is President Trump's endpoint, and where, where may he go? I really think if you were to go back and watch the video that President Trump played for Kim Jong-un, it was kind of laughed at, and it was made fun of, and it was very interesting to watch. Uh, but 
it kind of tells the story. It's, you know, we're, we're going to hold you to complete, fully verifiable denuclearization. There's a big deal at the end of this rainbow if you decide to comply. But if you don't, <laughs> and the video pretty clearly talks about consequences. It talks about opportunity, but it talks about consequences. And if you think maybe President Trump was just being clever, he was just going to throw that little video out there just to kind of capture some you know, immediate attention. I don't know. You know, I think maybe there was some serious forethought put into that. So I, I challenge everybody to go back and just take a quick peek at that four minute video again. Thanks. Thank you. At this, at this point, I'd like to uh, open it up to the guests here to, to, today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do three questions at a time so we can address the three, three questions and don't lose sight of what the questions are. So we'll start right here. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I've seen, uh, to answer Nick's question, I've seen this in one other place, and it's uh, FGM and honor killings. Um, and the reason those are ignored is because you might actually have to confront the clerics that don't stop it. And that's politically incorrect. So in this case, if you really see what's going on in North Korea, you have to... Uh, invoke the right, the responsibility to protect. And once you do that, you've got to go on to step two, which is now we have to do something about it. And then step three is the only thing to do about it is to pose the regime. And nobody wants to think about deposing the regime. So th that's the bottom line. Uh, when, you pr when you walk down that path, you come to Bruce's conclusion this morning and realize that the real game here is to try and think of a way to depose the regime short of war. Anyhow. Let me, let me go to you go uh, first, General Lee, and then we'll go come to you. Thanks, John. Giving me the opportunity. A okay. A question, you go. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have some questions. Listen. Karl Marx started from the surplus value. So he thought that the labor sub, uh, wages taken by the bourgeoisie. So North Korea started from the Marx Leninist communist country. Then why? Why they take money from the labor workers? 90% tax. That's opposite of the Marx Leninism. Of course, they are not uh, dictatorial government. They are not theor theoretically Marx Leninism. So I always think about that this contradiction. Where, where it's come from? So Marx says this way, North Korea at opposite way. So if you have any <laughs> idea about this, please answer. Thank you. And, and the third question, General Lee. Yes, sir. Based on my personal experience for the last 15 years dealing with the North Korean defectors personally, I'd like to bring up the two questions, okay? One is, uh, Mr. Hutchinson, that uh, uh, about human rights movement, particularly on the North Korean people, I think the guy who experienced it with the, that human rights problems, they can say something from their heart so that from that point of view, there are more than 30,000 North Korean defectors living in South Korea. So what is your suggestion to raise up those, those North Korean defectors to a force as a human rights movement to give a certain impact to the people who do not know about that problem? Second question is that uh, uh, Mr. Scalato, you talked about the, uh, human Rights Alliance. Everybody knows about that this kind of constraint and limit of dealing with their political society. It's so sad to see the, the uh, state level politicians playing with the human right for their own political purpose. Therefore, do you have any suggestion making non state level alliance for the human rights movement? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, let's start with you, George, and we'll take either or both. 
I'd like to like it to be short answers so we can get to other folks. Yes. So the how do we raise up the uh, the effectiveness of the thirty thousand plus defectors? I think you funding and and attention to uh, ensuring that the NGOs have uh, their voice heard uh, credibly. You know, work with the NGOs, but. Uh, other than that, right now, you know, governmental conditions may, may preclude uh, some of those opportunity. So, Greg? Um, if I may take the liberty of addressing the, the first question as well, I think that, of course, you, you're absolutely right, George. Funding resources are absolutely critical. Again, the U.S. government is trying hard. U.S. donors are trying hard. Um, it also takes um, persons within the community of North Korean escapees, people who are willing to lead and people who are willing to follow. But regrettably, we, we see that this community, it has to do with the limitations they face in terms of resources. It's a community that's quite fragmented. It's not as cohesive as we'd like it to be. And perhaps there are some cultural factors there if you think of the, the independence movement facing somehow um, during the Japanese occupation period, similar challenges. So it will take leadership. And I'm fully confident that those leaders are there within the North Korean escapee community. Um, generally, you raise another great point, uh, non-state alliances. Actually, I, I have a great example. Uh, you know how the, the Kim regime always claims that it was the US imperialists and their stooges who set up the UN Commission of Inquiry, which is, of course, nonsense. And, and moreover, the UN Commission of Inquiry was the result of international, transnational advocacy by a coalition of NGOs which we joined called the International Coalition to Stop Crimes Against Humanity in North Korea. We addressed our elected representatives here, our colleagues did the same in South Korea or in Japan, and eventually we persuaded elected officials and other officials that this was an issue that was extraordinarily important to people living under democratic societies, um, allies. Uh, this was a, a matter of true concern and we, we did manage to turn this in, into a movement that resulted eventually in the establishment of the, the UN Commission of Inquiry. No one group should assume full credit for this. There are a lot of groups involved, not only in Korea or in the United States, but also in Japan, in other places in Asia, Europe, even in Latin America. We need to resuscitate the movement precisely through this type of effort. So within our own community of civil society organizations, we need individuals and organizations that are willing to lead and individuals and organizations that are willing to follow. Dr. Kim. Yes, I think we uh, don't need to be confused about uh, the term the Marxism-Leninism. Uh, this uh, language has been already deleted even in North Korean constitution and uh, covenant of their Labour Party. So we can think very simply, uh, North Korean socialist system, socialism is not socialism. This is a socialism in, in North Korean version. It, in, it could be a variation of a socialism, but the North Korea's socialism is not real socialism. So we don't have to be uh, confused. Uh, the, everything there to legitimize uh, the hereditary uh, dictatorial power. You know? So it's not a, a socialist system, uh, precisely speaking. Uh, regarding R2P, uh, this gentleman again uh, mentioned that uh, actually, R2P, the concept of a responsibility to protect, uh, is not consummated the convention with a binding force or something like that. It's the concept is still being developed, you know. So this is the first time uh, applied to the Libya. Uh, at that time, successfully helped the organization of uh, multinational forces, and uh, but it need uh, on the part of action on, on on part of uh, mm. Security Council. You know. So uh, the application of this concept to North Korea uh, is, is impossible you know, at this moment because Russia and China will not uh, be cooperative in this regard. Uh, so this concept is very important. Mm -hmm. So personally, I hope uh, this concept will be more become more applicable, more widely, including North Korea, but not now. I'd like to Dr. mention. Wait, 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 well, I'm coming down to Dr. Eberstadt. Let me yeah, hit him and then I'll come to you. More. 
Dr. Yes. Kim, original socialism uh, raised by Ma Marx, Engels, and the, the Leninism is also bad. And also, bad application of the Kim Jong un and North Korea also bad, much more bad. So it's uh, worse the case. Uh, both of socialism is too bad. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Everstadt. Well, there's a. Um, there's an error in uh, political rhetoric, which is known as uh, reducio ad Hitlerum. And <laughs> I will try to avoid that, but I will point out that the real existing North Korean system today is a system which we might want to call racial socialism as opposed to Marxism. OK. Right in the back of the room there. Uh, just briefly, two questions. For first question is uh, George Hawkins. How can you how can you the the, the definition of uh, the human right? Uh, North Korea and China raise arguing the Western countries uh, applied for two standard human rights the principle to the countries in North Korea and China. And then my second question is to Gray. Yes, human rights is have many, many categories. It's uh, ethnic currencies, uh, famines for humanitarian assistance, and then the execution without any legal process or whatever. Uh, what can you see the future for the human rights issues in Korea Peninsula if we resolve the nuclearization issues? We, there are some concern about, uh, rather than North Korea is becoming more South Korea, North, South Korea is more becoming, becoming more, you know, North Korea because uh, it's a social fabric problem. Someone much like uh, to be more equality society rather than to see the more big disparity between having, have not, or headers for big uh, donation uh, from their parents or the some um, poor people like that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. This is a new question. Thank you, Bill Newcomb. I'd like to ask about, uh, is there a, a remote possibility that sufficient pressure or um, if not pressure, persuasion could be uh, done in the case of Beijing to get them to make changes in their policy of refoulement? More importantly, couldn't they be embarrassed by allowing uh, military security teams from North Korea operate freely uh, in the People's Republic. Uh, I don't know how valid it is. I just saw an, an article that talked about how these teams were double tasked with recovering defectors as well as selling narcotics. Um, and of course, it's not the first time that North Korea has sold narcotics in the PRC. I mean, they used to use their embassy as a base. So um, perhaps there are ways that China could be convinced to at least make some modifications of its policy? And if so, wouldn't that have uh, a lot of repercussions inside North Korea? Thank you. One more question in this, uh, group, this series. OK, George, uh, why don't you take it since you were directed, uh, and then we'll move down the panel. So, so what I'd like to do is, is just tee up uh, an answer that Greg can help me uh, elaborate on. But I think when the question was, what is human rights in the context of uh, North Korea? In, just in general. Well, I mean, there's, there's basic human rights. If you went down the laundry list of all the basic human rights, freedom to speak, freedom to exercise will, freedom to worship, freedom to read books, freedom to seek education, freedom to, if you went down the whole laundry list, you'd see that North Korea is probably in violation of all of them. Uh, now, is there maybe a more codified uh, definition of, 
I think, I think you're spot on, George, and this reminds me that uh, one type of criticism that's directed at us, North Korean human rights organizations, is that we focus exclusively on civil and political rights and not on social, economic, and cultural rights. And the answer to that is, by the way, the right to form unions, free unions, is an economic, social, and cultural right. Uh, collective bargaining and all of those labor rights, fundamental labor rights codified in the core ILO conventions are all economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, the future of the human rights issue in North Korea, if the nuclear issue is resolved, I firmly believe that the nuclear issue cannot be resolved without addressing the human rights issue. Um, it's impossible in the absence of trust we are constitutional republics or liberal democracies. The United States continues to be the leader of the free world. How can we guarantee the survival of a regime that's committing crimes against humanity? How can verification be possible in the absence of transparency? So we will have to address all of these critical human rights issues. Um, on South Korea, just uh, 10 days ago, I was very heartened by my former fellow countrymen in Romania, 50% of them came out and voted, and they voted a corrupt administration out of office. Uh, 30 years after they brought down the communist regime of Nicolae Ceausescu, I didn't think that they still had it. They had it. So I have uh, great confidence in the people of South Korea. I, I think that they, they will always make the right choices, and while we can see that there are issues, more attention can be paid to the rights of Koreans living in the North. Um, I think that fundamentally the people of South Korea will understand how to exercise their democratic rights and seek corrections whenever those corrections are necessary. And uh, I do think that the, the future of human rights on a unified Korean peninsula under a free, prosperous, democratic Republic of Korea, the future of human rights will be very bright. And that's the only future I can envision for Koreans living in the South and the North. Dr. Kim. I can skip you over. Well, I can skip you okay, <laughs> Dr. Ru. Let me, uh, nothing, Dr. Everstein. I don't know if they're afraid to answer that question or not, but thank you very much. Any other questions of this panel? Oh, well, one, I'd like you to recognize their great papers and their great discussions, and thank you very much uh, for everything uh, during this time.